Good evening, everyone. I hope you're out there. This is John McCall with Sonoma Land Trust. <clears throat> I'm going to be your host this evening for this webinar. And in a couple minutes, I'm going to introduce my colleagues, Tony Nelson and Taj Hittenberger. The three of us are going to be doing this presentation tonight. Thank you all so much for, for joining us, making us part of your evening. Um, I'm going to talk through a couple housekeeping matters, and then we'll get on to the program. So for those of you who are new to this, we're using Zoom's webinar platform, which is safer for participants and for, the, for us, the presenters and panelists. Um, in the webinar format, your video and audio are muted, so we can't see you. We can see a list of names of participants, um, but you're not able to participate in this format through video or, um, or through audio participation. So what we're asking you to do tonight, because we, we want you to be able to have all your questions answered and have dialogue and back and forth, is that you will use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. At any point during the presentation, please go ahead and, and type your question in there. Um, we, will, we have several other staff helping out tonight, uh, Neil Ramos and Maria Ramos. Um, they're behind the scenes making sure everything works from a technology standpoint and also um, collating and gathering and, and organizing your questions. So if you have a great idea for a question, just type it in as we go along. And then um, we're gonna do our presentation, which will last about 30 minutes. Then we'll have 15 minutes or so for Q&A. If you forgot, if you have a question that just comes up later on as we're all talking and exchanging information, please type it in at any point during the show tonight. Um, we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. Um, but we can't make a promise to that. We are, on the other hand, going to uh, record the webinar and it'll be available for viewing off the Sonoma Land Trust website uh, and our social media accounts. So if you miss something, uh, feel free to come back and, and catch it later. Um, I would like Tony and Taj to activate their video at this point. There's Taj and there's Tony. All right. So everyone, I'd like to to my, on the screen at least, um, my right is Tony Nelson. Wave to everybody, Tony. Okay, he is our Sonoma Valley Program Manager uh, in the Stewardship Department. He's been with the Land Trust for almost 12 years now, and he's responsible for managing our preserve system, the properties that we own in the Sonoma Valley, uh, as well as our conservation efforts, which includes the Wildlife Corridor Program, which we're gonna talk about tonight, and our, our fire program, our wildfire, uh, Wildlands Collaborative. And to my left on the screen is Taj Hittenberger. Uh, Taj has been with the Land Trust for uh, about a year and a half now. Um, he's also in the stewardship department. He's a project manager working directly with Tony to manage all of our properties and to work on our larger uh, landscape scale collaborations. So those are my two fellow panelists tonight. Um, you all can... Uh, stay on screen. Um, I just wanted to make sure for those, I'm sure we have some of our, our Sonoma Land Trust stalwarts and, and longtime supporters on the, on the webinar tonight. But for those of you who aren't, who are new to the Land Trust, who don't know that much about our work, we got our start in 1976 uh, in the Sonoma Valley. So we've been around for over 40 years now, working to protect land in Sonoma County. Our mission uh, is pretty broad. We want to protect the, the natural lands of Sonoma County for everyone's benefit. We have a staff of about 35. Um, and as I'm sure many of you know, we have programs all over the county, ranging from uh, wildfire, wildlands collaborative work, the Wildlife Corridor Project, sustainable agriculture, and our work out on the coast and Russian River. So we've got a lot of projects tonight. We're focusing in on really the Sonoma Valley, Sonoma Mountain region. Um, so that's a little bit about SLT. Uh, we're gonna do this fairly informally. I'm gonna be the host and I've got some uh, questions that I'm gonna pose to, to Tony and Taj. Um, so we'll have plenty of back and forth between us. And I'm gonna start the slideshow here. There we go. Okay, Tony Nelson, let's start off with, you got the question right at the top of the slide. What is a wildlife corridor and why are they important? Uh, well, this picture, I don't have a lot to say. It's just one of my favorites and I thought it'd be a good start to show. Um, 
So if we go to the next one and answer, what is a wildlife corridor? Um, in a nutshell, a wildlife corridor is strips or patches of habitat that allow animals to move from one block of habitat. In the schematic you're looking at there, the, the gray wildland blocks would be considered to have sufficient quantity and quality of habitat to support the species in question. The white between them would be inhospitable for a variety of reasons. And the dark gray are the corridors that are amenable to animals. They may not be able to live there. Maybe they can or some can. But it's amenable for flow of animals between those two wildland blocks. Um, now, these occur on multiple scales, or on almost any scale. I mean, so as an example, it could be, uh, you know, a simple hedgerow between two little remnant patches of woodland that allows dusky footed wood rats pass through, um, you know, an irrigated um, alfalfa field, for instance. Um, or it could be a large, wide, dense riparian zone along a stream that connects between two national parks. So these things happen on, on multiple scales. So what, um, what's the fuss, John? Um, why do these matter? That, yep, thank you. How about that, Tony? Thank you. That my very subtle cue and you caught What's right the on. fuss? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so dispersal is another word for movement um, of animals. Is, is really important for a variety of reasons. I mean, we've all heard about migratory herds like wildebeest and and uh, you know caribou, not all animals do that, but all mobile animals essentially have to move sometime during their life at least for some things to meet some needs. So maybe it's going to find a mate. Um, maybe it's finding a new den because the old one was taken over by wasps. But I, I highlighted just a few here. Um, if you dig into these, everything becomes interrelated. So I'm not gonna try to get complicated on it, but one of the things animals have to do is be able to um, change with their environment. They're highly in tune to it. And so if it changes, they have to change. So we're looking forward to changes in temperature and water availability um, over the coming years. That could cause shifts in plant communities, habitats, and animals have to be able to respond to that and move with it. Um, Access to more abundant and diverse habitat, um, that's a very general thing. One of the things I like to stress there is the importance of young animals being able to move away from their parents' home site when they grow. It's most easily seen in you know, territorial predators, for instance, um, mountain lions around us, that uh, you know, a young male, when he's about to come to age, um, the dominant male that already has that territory is either going to kill it or chase it out. And then that juvenile, that young adult, has to go find his own home range. And that could be hundreds of miles away, right? Maybe that's the fuss you were talking about earlier. That's the fuss. That's the fuss. And, and actually, it's super dangerous for them. They are very important to the third bullet point, which I'll mention in a second. But even though they've been raised by mom and or dad, um, they're still really inexperienced. And so, it's often the young ones that get into trouble, like, you know, ending up under a shrub at the downtown Santa Rosa Mall, which a lion did a couple years ago. So the third is not uh, something I, I talk extensively about because it's not my bailiwick so much, but um, I think everybody's aware of uh, genetic flow. It's important. Um, in, in an isolated population, particularly if the numbers are low, inbreeding could make that population much more susceptible to things like disease and pathogens and ultimately extinction. So constant flow of genetic material between uh, population, subpopulation, however you want to call it, is really important. So um, you, can, you can go forward, John. Um, a, a few Characteristics of functional corridors. Corridor science is actually advancing really quickly, and, and this is extremely um, high elevation here, but they're really important ones. So, um, efficient length and width, obviously length, right, to get from A to B. 
to accommodate the species in question. Um, I mentioned multiple scales for truly effective landscape scale conservation that we're working on. We have to work at in land. The other thing is it's really important to have really high quality and varied habitat and water and other stuff like that that animals need while they're moving along. And ultimately, while a large corridor landscape scale, there will be animals of some species that are actually just living their whole life within that corridor. The idea is that it has to be have freedom of movement so that all those species that we're working on and get from point A. So that was a really admittedly brief um, conceptual look at what a corridor is and why it's important. And, and I think, John, are you now going to make it real for us? Well, I'm gonna, we're going to talk about scale for a minute. Let me ask you one question, though. Um, how new is the science of studying wildlife corridors? Is it something that we've always known about? Why is it getting more attention in the last few years? It's, it's been around for decades. If, if anybody's heard of the theory of island biogeography, that's, I learned it in graduate school <laughs> a long time ago, but it's been decades. Um, so it's been, you know, theoretically known as important, um, but really it's been in the last I'd say 10 years that it got really hot and it's one of the most important aspects of conservation right now, largely triggered by the um, projections of climate change. Mm -hmm. And that dynamic that I mentioned, that if species and if plants and, and communities and habitats are gonna be shifting around, not only do the plants have to move, but animals have to be able to move with that. And so, you know, even if you have one of those blocks, if it changes dramatically and so no longer, for instance, um, can handle the numbers that it once did, some of those animals are going to have to go find that habitat somewhere else. Okay, thank you. So we're going we're gonna to step back for a minute and talk about scale. Uh, Tony mentioned landscape scale, and that's very important for our work in Sonoma. Uh, we want our work to be meaningful. In Sonoma Valley, we hopefully are working at a scale that is meaningful for all the wildlife and, and habitat types we find in, in the whole county. But let's go way beyond that for a minute. So as Tony was just describing, uh, the, uh, the theory of wildlife corridors has been around for a long time, but the study and discipline of where are they, how do they function, uh, how can we ground truth what is sometimes conceptual is really something we've been working on now for the last six or seven years at the Land Trust. So this slide, shows a regional perspective. Um, going back to 2010, 2011, scientists from all over the Bay Area wanted to better understand where are the key habitat areas. Uh, you saw one in one of the early slides, a wildland block, um, sometimes called a stronghold. But where are the big habitat areas that we know are going to support a lot of species? And how are, species, how are, how are wildlife going to move between those areas? So this effort, critical linkages, which you'll hear us referring to repeatedly tonight, the word linkage is, is essentially interchangeable with corridor. Um, so hopefully that won't be confusing. This study came out in 2013, and it looked at a 17 million acre area from the Mendocino National Forest uh, up in Mendocino County and further north, all the way down to San Luis Obispo County and the Hearst Ranch. So basically the, the eastern boundary was the interior coast mountains and then the Pacific on the west. On this map, you'll see the big, the dark green uh, coloration are the, the large wildland blocks. The lighter green, which hopefully you can see uh, on your screen, are the corridors. The scientific uh, consortium, a, a big group of folks worked on this for years. They came up with 14 different corridors, uh, um, including almost, almost 3 million acres of land. So that's 3 million acres to connect 17 million acres uh, successfully. And again, we've ta we're talking about biodiversity here in general. Uh, this group identified over 66 species to look at uh, in terms of movement and corridor needs. So that's big picture. Zooming in a little bit more, I uh, apologize. I was going to take one of these graphics out of here. Um, let's focus in on the one on the left side of the screen that says critical linkages, Bay Area and beyond. So our work for Sonoma Land Trust, even though there are multiple wildlife corridors in the county, our work is focused in on what we call the Marin Coast to Blue Ridge critical linkage. 
So on this map, you'll see uh, at Point Reyes, Marin Coast, and then kind of a rose-colored uh, squiggly line connecting to the east, to the right of the screen, to the Blue Ridge Mountains of Napa and Lake Counties. That's an 85-mile corridor with focal species of uh, badger, uh, mountain lion. Was there a third species, Tony? It was badgers, mountain lions, I believe, were the, the main species we were. Okay. Um, so again, this is the Marin Coast to Blue Ridge critical linkage. And you can see it cuts right across the southern part of Sonoma County. Um, so we're going to zoom in one more level here. Uh, this map, I want you to look at the dark brown shading uh, that you'll see. I can use my cursor here. Um, I'm gonna, sorry, I'm going to move my speaker view. There we go. Okay. So this dark brown that you see on your screen uh, is the Sonoma Valley, excuse me, the Marin Coast to Blue Ridge critical linkage. We, Tony in particular, and, and, and my colleagues, Wendy Ellie and others, focused in going back to about 2010 and 11 on a pinch point. When we looked at the map, we saw that it narrowed down dramatically uh, right at, in near Glen Ellen. That if you're crossing Sonoma Valley uh, as a bear or a mountain lion or deer, you've got to get across a, a lot of vineyard land, uh, the, the developed town of Sonoma. So this pinch point, this corridor across Sonoma Valley is where we decided to start our research into the corridor. We're going to talk a lot more about that tonight. Um, so there's three, three prongs to our work, three legs of the stool. One is science and research. Uh, the other is acquisition of land that we identify as key priorities to protect in the corridor. And then the third are measures, uh, land management techniques, stewardship measures we can take to improve the conditions of the corridor. Um, my work for the Land Trust is on the acquisition side. And so tonight we're just going to highlight McCormick Ranch, which is a big 600, almost 700 acre property up in the Mayacamas Mountains. Um, we are purchasing this property and one of the main reasons is its value to the wildlife corridor. Um, these are some photos from McCormick Ranch. Uh, Taj and Tony set up cameras out there uh, in 20, actually just last year. Um, again, we had maps that showed where we thought corridors were on the ground based on the land isn't developed, it's not in vineyards, it's not in urban development, it's open, big acreage. Um, but we also need to go out there and see what's really there. And the good news is, as you can see from these photos, there's a lot of wildlife. Um, and I guess the word that we can use to express a lot of wildlife is biodiversity. Take it away, Taj. Right. Um, you know, it's always fun to see those large mammals, the bears and lions, and you know, the charismatic megafauna that requires such a large habitat for their home range. But really what we're focusing on are on in our work is maintaining biodiversity at all scales. So as Tony touched on a little bit earlier, um, kind of at the largest scale, we think about a diversity of habitats, a, a mosaic of grasslands, woodland, chaparral, conifer forest. It's really important to have a mixture of all of these because different species, you know, make their home in different habitats or at the, the edge, the ecotones between different ecosystems. And so if we go another level below that, we're, we want to maintain a diversity of species as well, both within those habitats and among them. And then another layer below that is a diversity of individuals, as, as Tony mentioned, genetic diversity, uh, diversity of individuals within distinct populations. And that's really important now, but also as we look into the future, as uh, we anticipate you know, changes in temperature and precipitation. We want to have as much, you know, as, as much variety of life as possible going into the future because as habitat compositions change across the landscape, we're going to need animals to be able to adapt to that. So the more diversity among life we have, the more able it will be to adapt. Um, you know, as, the, as habitats change, we can also expect um, that the range of different species will change, will shift accordingly. And we don't exactly know how that'll work. You know, species may move to the north, they may move to higher elevations. We may even start to get species in Sonoma County that we haven't seen here before. But what's really important right now, 
and in our work moving forward is maintaining the biodiversity and maintaining the connectivity between those large blocks of habitat because that'll that's essential to those species being able to adapt going forward. Thank you, Taj. I think it's a, a great way to kind of summarize what we're trying to do at, at a large scale here. We're gonna we're gonna turn back to Tony and kind of dig in a little bit on how we as Sonoma Land Trust ground truth and studied the Sonoma Valley Wildlife Corridor um, and then extrapolated out from there to guide a lot of our conservation conservation work. So Tony, why don't you explain um, how do we know that the Sonoma Valley Wildlife Corridor is actually a corridor? Yeah, that's uh, that. Uh, you know, you mentioned, John, the, the breadth of things that we've been working on for this corridor, but one of the first things we did was, was this study. And, you know, the, the, the critical linkages and, and other studies that identified this area were, um, were scientifically based um, evaluations of landscape conditions and habitat needs. They weren't based on tracking animals moving through this area, right? And so we actually, there was no data as to whether or not animals were moving through this section of the corridor that we're looking here, which is the pinch point you pointed out. Let me just orient everybody real quick. I'm sorry, yeah, just, just so people are wondering. So I'm moving my cursor on the screen. Hopefully you can see it. The, the, the Sonoma Valley Wildlife Corridor is outlined in white. So this white outline that runs across the screen, that pinch point is right, <clears throat> excuse me, at Highway 12, the red line running north-south and Arnold Drive right there. So the pinch point across Sonoma Valley is right really where the Sonoma Developmental Center is and Boobery Preserve and all, all the properties right there uh, south of Glen Ellen. Yeah, good, good. And that's um, Sonoma Mountain to the west, left there, and the Myokamas rising up from the valley to the east. Uh, so, you know, if we were gonna spend our limited resources protecting the, the functionality of this corridor, if we were gonna garner funding support, if we were going to hopefully get other landowners to support the whole idea, we needed to show this was in fact a corridor. So the idea, um, we put out 48 cameras, I believe, in a grid, the, the yellow dots represent that, actually triangle. Um, and the idea was to compare the west of Arnold Drive, so the Sonoma Mountain area, compare that to between the two roads and also to the Myokamas to the east. And the idea was if, you know, if, if we got similar species um, and you know, more or less the same capture rates, a capture being an animal caught on a photograph, um, then we would assume that animals were able to move through there. Um, and I stress, you know, or I shouldn't actually, that was a little bit overstated, but we would take it as an indicator that animals were moving through. And we have to put it that way because we weren't actually tracking individual animals to follow their movements. We didn't have that capacity. Um, so we, you know, we use cameras. They reliably get pictures of small to large mammals, um, and you know that's not the full breadth of the biodiversity that um, Todd was talking about, but that's what cameras can get, and it's a relatively inexpensive process. But also, you know, some of the species in that group, lions, bears, right, are the ones that have the largest territories and area requirements. And so they're also probably the most susceptible to barriers. And also scientists typically believe that, you know, the status of, of those species are good indicators of how everything else is doing. We felt comfortable with that. Also, those two roads are in red because um, roads are, are known to be um, substantial problems for at least some wildlife. Um, not to mention people in cars, right? Wildlife on roads is not a great mix. Um, and we wanted to know if those were functioning as barriers for any of these species. Um, so that's me down there hugging a tree so I don't fall on a blackberry bramble. While Ahiga and Tanya are setting up a camera, they are with Pathways for Wildlife and we, uh, we worked with them to study all the underpasses 
if animals were using those to get past the roads. Um, we'll, we'll move on to some of the pictures in a second, but if you could just, just as we were discussing, this is such a new and evolving field of science. So these folks, Tanya and Higa, have their own consulting firm. And just, just for people's information, what, what's their specialty statewide? Uh, well, their, their, their company's called Pathways for Wildlife, and their primary purpose is to um, identify and study corridors. And they do spend a lot of time on roads. Um, they were pretty instrumental down with some work going on at Highway 17, where they were finding a lot of mountain lions um, being killed on road. And it was a concern because it's so much of it was happening. And they identified where they were coming and trying to get to. And, and uh, now, actually, they're, uh, I understand they're working on a project to create an underpass for that. But that's, that's great, the that's main great. line of their work. Just wanted folks to know that there are some specialists out there that we work with uh, who really are essential to our work. So, pictures. So yeah. many pictures. So we had these 40, those cameras up, actually 48 plus the underpass for two years. We got like 200,000 pictures. And every one of those pictures has to be looked at <laughs> and cataloged if we find anything in them. Took a lot of time, but we were, we had a really great cadre of interns from Sonoma State University that did most of it and, and they were really great. Um, so, you know, we got most of the stuff we expected to get. Um, foxes, there's a couple of young bucks sparring there. That black bear is the, um, I think we only got two during our study, and this was up in the Myakuma side. And uh, I believe that was, that was a female who just wandered down to, to check things out. And I think she left um, shortly thereafter because she wasn't seen again. And uh, I don't know. I not everybody likes turkeys. I actually really like turkeys a lot, and they seem to like the cameras because <laughs> they pose for the cameras unlike anything else. Um, so, be careful, so, or we're going to end up with twenty questions about how people can manage wild turkeys on their property. So, moving on from the turkeys. Okay. So you know, a um, lot of bobcats. Um, Jackrabbits are, are spotty. They're habitat specific, right? They don't like deep forests necessarily. And so, um, but they're around where they should be. The coyotes were interesting. Um, one of the things I didn't mention is in comparing the species and numbers through those three different grid areas, we have to account for habitat variability in those. And they're a good example because on the Sonoma County side, um, it's rangeland, right? Open, a lot of it's still grazed and it's perfect coyote country and we got a really nice pack there. Um, I hadn't heard that they were causing any trouble so I'm happy about that. Very healthy looking beautiful animals. On the central and the east grids all we ever got were lone individuals and it looked like they were typically the young ones like I described earlier. That's not their preferred habitat that rugged forested country is not really their preferred. So I think what we were seeing were coyotes who were on the hunt to find new territory. Um, and we got, you know, we got lines most of the places we mentioned. I, I would mention here, though, that, um, you know, Audubon Canyon Ranch's uh, Living with Lions project has been collared, radio, putting radio collards on quite a few lions now. I'm not even sure. Last I heard it was 14, but that's not all right in the corridor we're talking about. Um, so they're getting really good data that is answering those questions about how are individuals moving through the landscape. And that's really great. Um, I'd like to do that with a couple of other the, of the key species that would give us better clues. Um, but that's, uh, that's really valuable. So what are some of the, the big takeaways um, from the two years of camera work, from all those pictures? What do we learn in, in, uh, in all that work? Well, yeah, these are kind of cursory statements here, but um, all of the, the species we would expect to see here, um, almost all of them, um, certainly the common ones, based on the numbers we were getting um, and the movement through those underpasses, actually. That, remember, that's going from one grid to another. So that, that was key also, that they're all able to move through this corridor here. We were even able to spot um, some relatively rare things, uh, at least rarely seen. Um, 
in so I've been asking for years if anybody could uh, let me know if they've been seeing wood ducks nesting and they like to nest up freshwater creeks um, and they nest in hollows and trees and then when the chicks are young they'll pop out they get in the water and then the hen leads them down the stream to a permanent body of water like a lake or a pond and nobody had could tell me that they have ever seen wood ducks nesting in all those streams coming up out of Sonoma Valley, at least that I asked, until we got this picture at one of the bridges of this hen leading her 12 little chicks downstream. Um, and then a lot of sources, or at least some of the sources that I read, thought that porcupines were actually no longer occurring in, in Sonoma. And I know it's not a great picture, but it's the only one we got of a porcupine and that is actually also heading underneath the bridge. We got that one. And uh, that was really exciting to me. In fact, these were kind of two of my favorites right here. Um, I subsequently followed this stream up and found its habitat where it was hanging out. So that was And then, of course, you know, as, as these two indicate, and as I mentioned, the, the passage through bridges and culverts is really critical. So that's kind of it in a. Okay. Thank you. Um, we're gonna, we're gonna, as I mentioned earlier, there's uh, this for the land trust, there's been three aspects to our work on wildlife corridors, the science, um, the study, and the hopefully contribution to our understanding of wildlife corridors, both here and, and more generally, um, protecting land that is critical within those corridors. And then what can we actually do to make things better? Um, what are the factors? What are the things we learned that are the biggest challenges to wildlife moving across the landscape, and where can we make some big differences uh, through our work? So Taj is gonna, gonna handle this next part of the presentation. Yeah, <clears throat> so, you know, we understand that <clears throat> movement across the landscape is critical, and an important part of that is understanding, as you've mentioned, John, uh, what the barriers are to that movement. And so Sonoma Land Trust, actually convened a technical advisory committee of wildlife experts in the region and that committee after evaluating the literature um, identified this list here as some of those potential barriers you know we could spend quite a bit of time going through these but i, I really just want to focus on two right now and those are fencing and roads um, fences are pretty ubiquitous across the landscape they serve some really important purposes anything from you know a wooden fence keeping your dog in your backyard to a barbed wire fence um you know keeping keeping your livestock in a certain pasture um and most if not all fences uh you know create some barrier to movement for some species of wildlife and um while it would be great to remove fencing that's not always an option sometimes it is we've done quite a bit of that on our preserves but we uh with the with funding help from the moore foundation we've also been working with neighboring uh neighboring properties from the valley up to the top of sonoma mountain to replace some old fencing with a uh, wildlife friendly fence design and that's the the diagram you can see here i know it's it, it's pretty detailed but the the two main things to point out are the uh, the smooth wires on the top and bottom, and uh, the large gap between the ground oh, and that. Sorry, that was a, keep going. Sorry. <laughs> the uh, the large larger gap between the ground and the bottom wire, and then the larger gap between the top and second wire. And really, what that does is allows animals to more easily move under or jump over the top without getting snagged on barbed wire. And if we look at the the image up top, it's, it's really hard to get a good picture of a wire fence, but on the right we have woven sheep wire and the gaps in that fence are probably about four to six inches. So not much can get through there. It's going all the way down to the ground. Maybe some things could jump over, but if we look left of that wooden post, we have a wildlife friendly fencing design as the smooth wires on top and bottom, a nice gap underneath. And, uh, you know, there have been some, as I mentioned, some properties that we've helped replace fencing on. And one of them is the 
Sonoma Mountain Ranch Preservation Foundation up near the top of Sonoma Mountain. And they were uh, nice enough to let us set up some cameras on some critical stretches of fencing that they replaced. And we saw some really wonderful results like this. Um, a mountain lion in daylight, no less, walking up to one of these new fences, giving that smooth bottom wire a sniff, deciding that looks fine and just dipping right under no problem. You know, I'll, I'll point out that that line could very easily jump over, but <clears throat> it's always nice to see one easily pass under. And we've also gotten tons and tons of deer easily passing under there as well. Um, I, a fun little fact about this video, uh, you'll see at the bottom, it's from 8 a.m. in the morning. I got to this camera that morning at 8.15 <clears throat> to replace the batteries. And um, I'm sure I've... <laughs> You've come uh, close. You've come yeah, very close. I, yeah. come close. I haven't seen one, but maybe this is the closest I've come. Um, so yeah, and they've, you know, they've really loved these fences up there. There was some initial concern because they, they graze livestock up there and um, there were some worries that younger cows could slip under the fence and wander away from the herd, but they haven't had any problems. And they really love knowing that wildlife can move more freely across their property. So they actually just recently decided that any stretch of fence that needs to be repaired from now on, they're gonna replace with this wildlife friendly fencing design, which is, is really great. That is great. Yeah. That's great. Well, and, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Tony. No, I was, I was just going to agree. Yeah. Okay, awesome we're all in result. agreement. So fencing, um, it, it looks like there are solutions with fencing and it takes cooperation and it takes, it takes a lot of hard work to change out the fencing, but something that may be a bit more complex are how do wildlife safely pass under our road system? So why don't you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Tony just mentioned that underpasses, you know, going under bridges and through culverts is essential for wildlife. And there's a few pictures on the right here of various animals using culverts. I especially like the, uh, the raccoons swimming through the culvert during a winter storm. Those are fun pictures to find. Um, but this, this culvert on the left uh, is under Highway 12, right in the middle of that, that pinch point in the corridor that you pointed out, John. It's just south of Sonoma Valley Regional Park. And we've had camera, a camera on this culvert since 2015. And in 2017, in conjunction with the Sonoma County Water Agency, we actually removed a really big thicket, dense, dense thicket of blackberry on the west side of the road. And that's what it looked like after the blackberry was cleared. And we kept cameras there because we wanted to see if removing that dense vegetation removed a, a functional barrier that was limiting wildlife movement through the culvert. Um, you know, we, we don't want animals going up onto the road. It's much safer to go through a culvert like this, a nice big one, especially this one's about five feet tall, eight feet wide. So we cleared it out, kept cameras there, and uh, and then we we crunched the crunched the data, so to speak, this year, and we found some really good results. Um, the occurrence numbers, or maybe a better way to think of that, um, that that second bullet there is that most species that use the culvert ended up using it more frequently after we removed the blackberry, and uh, we had eight species we captured eight species on camera before the blackberry removal. And then afterwards, we got an additional four there. So brought the number up to 12. And they were, you know, really exciting species to see. We got a mountain lion photo there. You can kind of see it's, it's got a, it looks like a black ring around its neck. It's one of the lions that the uh, Living with Lions program at Audubon Canyon Ranch has collared. So Whenever we get a photo like this, we send it over to them so they can confirm their data. But uh, it was great to see mountain lion. We ended up getting tons of deer moving through as well, um, which is exciting. And as you can see, a few more species. But what this shows is that wildlife will respond positively to barriers being removed. And if we can maintain open, safe access across the landscape, we can help maintain the health of the wildlife populations that live within the corridor and those that move through the corridor.
which is really important. So some simple, simple steps uh, that can make a big difference. And these are a couple different underpasses, um, culverts on Highway 12 uh, in the Sonoma Valley. Maybe Tony and Taj, you could talk a little bit about how we've looked more broadly. At, we haven't been able to necessarily expand this program, but we have looked at some of the other, maybe just mention some of the other areas we've looked at in terms of um, road mortality species. Sure, subsequent to this, um, we also worked with Pathways for Wildlife to look at underpasses down in the South County. So um, actually under 101, Adobe Road, um, that area there. And um, we did a similar study. Um, it wasn't up for two years. And it was interesting um, because the, the culverts were different down there than along Highway 12. We had different structures, um, different internal dynamics in them. Um, and also the species we got were different um, because that area is much more open down there. So it's, it's actually badger country. And so we did, uh, we haven't had a lot of traction down there, but you know, one of the th things we saw that actually really sort of made us all a little bit sad was we were looking at one culvert and this sort of gets back to why we did the work that Taj just described. One culvert that was actually, we could tell it wasn't great because it was, it went too deep and it actually retained water structure and stuff. So animals could get to it, but then they didn't like what they saw. And sure enough, it was one of the most common areas that we saw roadkill. And that was under um, Adobe Road and traffic can move on Adobe Road. And we found, you know, a mother and two young badgers that were killed all at one time up there and all sorts. Of so, you know, that's obviously a bigger fix than what we can do because that absolutely is a structural fix. But yeah. um, we hope to talk with the road agency more and more to sort of point out where things, where improvements can be. And, and that's one of the things that Tony's work and Taj's work has, has made a big difference. Um, this is open doors with Caltrans, conversations that might not have happened a few years ago. Uh, and this is actually happening all over the state. There are some high level conversations happening so that new road projects, new bridge replacement projects could hopefully have better under crossings and uh, considerations for wildlife. Um, we're bumping up against kind of the end of our presentation time. So um, are you closing this one out, Taj? I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, if you want to learn more, you can uh, definitely check out our website, um, Sonoma Valley Wildlife Corridor under current initiatives. And particularly um, this image here on the right is the cover of a brochure that we have. So if you're wondering, you know, specifically what you can do to help wildlife in the corridor, um, there, there's some more details in there and it's a, it's a good resource to look at. Thank you. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen in the presentation. We're gonna switch gears here and move to Q&A. So now you should see all of us. And if I do this, this may be the most challenging part of this whole evening, because I have to read your questions and try to look at the camera at the same time. Okay, first question from Sherry Cardo, Communications Director for Sonoma Land Trust. Um, I would say Taj or Tony, whoever wants to um, tackle these, we'll start with Sherry's question. Are there any east-west corridors that connect the Sierra Nevadas to the Blue Ridge? How do species get from the coast ranges all the way over to the Sierras? Not my uh, my specialty there, but I'm guessing you're gonna have to go up to Shasta, over to Siskiyou Trinity, in North yeah. West California, and then come down through Humboldt and Mendocino counties, or down south across the Tehachapi's, and then up. But the valley itself doesn't provide an awful lot of opportunity. Um, you know, they're working on it though. A lot of the um, land trusts and other organizations are trying to really build up riparian zones again. Um, I mentioned that those are really effective corridors. And so I don't know if they they obviously probably won't stretch the whole way, but over time we might be able to build up some, some new connections. Uh, so 
in the meantime, we'll do our work out here on the on the coast. And um, someone asked badgers, where are they located in Sonoma County? I've never seen a badger. How could somebody see a badger if possible? Yeah, they're pretty elusive um, and shy, and so they're not they're not often seen. But they like open grasslands, and and you know down there um, that area I was talking about, sort of uh, what east. Right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, but they are. Um, Taj, do you remember, aren't they a, a species of concern in California? I'm not sure. Or are they not yet? OK, well, I know a lot of people are concerned about them. So the other thing is people who do know don't say very often where they are. Um, here's an interesting question, uh, which I, I personally think is a goal that we should all be thinking about seriously. How close is Sonoma County to meeting the goal set by E.O. Wilson in this 2016 book, Half Earth, of 50% of the land set aside for supporting biodiversity? How close are we in Sonoma to getting half of our land set aside? Do you want to handle that, John? Yeah, we're about a quarter of our <laughs> way there. I guess that's why I knew that we've, we've protected through um, you know, one thing in Sonoma County, we don't have a lot of national forests or national parks, but we have a great state park system, a great county park system, and then a lot of land that we protected that's still in private ownership, but it is protected forever for, for habitat and, and natural resources. So about a quarter of the county is in protected land status. Um, how did the recent fires affect wildlife and the corridor, deers, bear? What, what did we learn from the fires? vis-a-vis -vis the corridor? Um, well, fire, um, I'll try to answer this without getting long-winded and it's too late already, but fire is a natural process that has actually shaped the landscape for millennia, right? And animals have grown up in that, call it, right? So many of them actually know how to deal with the fire. They flee. <laughs> In fact, in, in the big fire, the one thing that occurred to me walking out on the, the charred herbs that we have is I was thinking about all the, and I didn't see a single dead animal as a result of the fire. Not that there weren't any, um, but I didn't see any. And it occurred to me that spiders were probably the hardest hit because they didn't get anywhere and they're hanging out on a web. So I, I felt sorry for the spider. But um, you know, they know how to deal with it in to large degree. And we had, you know, three weeks after the, the big nuns fire, I saw a group of six deer hanging out in a charred, you know, hillside on over in Glen Oaks, or uh, excuse me, Glen, yeah, Glen Oaks Ranch. And within a short amount of time, you know, the plants recover. I think everybody, at least around here, has, has realized that now the plants come back pretty quickly and everything else follows it. And so we're, in a short time and that saw all the same animals moving for instance under those bridges that we found that are really important um, in a very short amount of time and and I would guess you wouldn't see a lot of change now if you went back okay um, this is just a little quickie question but for people with their favorite species have we did we get any recordings of ringtails uh, in our camera work or in our corridor studies no, um, I don't know if you caught it, but when I was talking about all the com all the species we know around here, we got on camera. I stumbled on that because we didn't. A couple of the things that I really wanted to get and we never did was ring tail cat. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to get weasel because mm -hmm. I know weasels are here. They're actually I'm not too surprised because the way you have to work these cameras doesn't necessarily favor weasels and how they like you know, bathe. Um, but no, we didn't. They're in the county, but we never got one. Okay. Um, what surprised you? What were some of the findings from the study that surprised you? Not an extraordinary Are you one. beyond surprising at this point? I'm just so jaded. I've seen it all. <laughs> no, well, you know, I, I, I guess the first thing that comes to mind, well, okay, two things popped in my head. Uh, I was surprised to get the porcupine, and that's partly why I was so excited to get it. And, um, you know, the staff teased me because I think within a day, 
I, I left the office and started hiking up into the Myocomus to try to find where they were hanging out, and I did find it. And, and so that was a surprise and, and a really exciting one for me. Um, another one, I don't think it was a surprise, but it was, it was um, nice affirmation, I guess. You know, there's sometimes concern that when we use these cameras, we're going to be disturbing wildlife. And one of the things you don't want to do when you're studying wildlife is disturb them and alter their natural you know, behaviors and roots. But we use cameras that were no flash. They would do it infrared. But the animal could not perceive any flash, no white flash at night, and no noise. Mm -hmm. So it was really cool to see, especially early on when we started, animals are so in tune to everything. I mean, their, their survival depends on it, right? They would look at it. So, you know, and we, they were camouflage boxes, right, and, and stuff. And, but they would see it, and they would look at it, and then they would never pay attention to it again. So that was really good. There was only one exception to that, and that was a site um, that was frequented by a mother lion and her three kittens. And we saw them one, one time we went. The next time we went, I showed up, and this particular cam we had to have on a stake rather than a tree, and it was lying on the ground took it back and the first like three pictures were a lion kitten walking to the camera and then we got about 850 of blue sky <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> with the occasional moth flying over um, and some clouds so the, the the lion kittens liked to uh you know do what youngsters do yeah break stuff um there are three or four questions that i think kind of get to a, a similar issue which is how do we know where wildlife corridor boundaries are? Um, how do animals, it's not as if they get on a conveyor belt and now they're on the corridor. What, how can you talk about, you know, what's, what's a corridor, what isn't? Yeah, Taj, I'm boundaries? talking a lot, but I'm gonna take this. Yeah. Because <laughs> this, this gets to something I usually put in talks when I talk about it, but for time I didn't today. So remember, these, uh, these maps that we have with lines drawn on them are human constructs, right? Animals don't look at maps. And so, you know, we, we try to put, when we map them, we try to blur the lines because to make the point that the animals don't follow this, we're not saying this is the only place animals go. Um, what these things are intended to do, these, these exercises, are to indicate based on those evaluations of the landscape and the, and the wildlife needs, what is the safest, um, is that the best word? Um, okay, I, I'll use it. What, what's the safest route for an animal to get from point A to point B, right? I mentioned the rest of it is relatively inhospitable, but a wildlife doesn't look at a map, uh, an animal doesn't look at a map. So, they also, you know, birds can fly up and they can see a long way, but you know, a, a bobcat can't see real far. So it has to make decisions along, along the way. And so the, the, the point of the corridor is not that it's the only place animals go. They are gonna go a lot of places. Hence my ref reference to the line that ended up at the Santa Rosa Mall. That poor thing took some wrong turns, right? Um, but it was in a high degree of danger. Anybody could see that, right? So that's the point of the corridor. Not that it's the only place animals are going to be, but for conservation purposes, that's where we ought to focus our time and energy because it's okay for them to get. Okay. Sorry Thank for being you. kind of worried. No, that that's great. We're 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 getting close to the end of our our time here. I do want to, for all the bird lovers out there, I think I'm, myself included, I have to ask. So what about birds? Uh, the cameras did capture some birds other than turkeys, but how, how does this tie in with our understanding of birds and, and their movement and habitat needs? You know, we did get some birds. I, I would say the most common bird we get with the cameras are quail because they're on the ground so much. Um, but Tony, you, you must have a better answer than that. <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, Tom. Uh, well, okay, so the idea of the corridor, birds absolutely are affected by what all the other stuff we're talking about, roads, 
human activities, right, conversion of habitats. So they're affected by all of that stuff too. And so the corridor is important for them too. The, the difference, obviously, of course, is birds can fly. And yes, turkeys can fly. Um, birds can fly. So it's a little bit easier for them to get over the road, get over the city, get over the mountain range, right? So while the, the, the corridor is important for them, and if I recall correctly, the critical linkages process did have some birds included in it. Um, I think it was some birds. Um, I don't remember what right now. So they are. Um, part of the reason it looks like we're focused on not birds is because our camera study didn't really work with birds. Um, though we did get some, we got a couple of golden eagles that one of them bombed a raven and landed right in front of the camera. So I got some of my raven. But. Well, I think I know we talk about this all the time at work and we could keep talking about it into the evening here. I want to honor everyone's time. So I think, and I apologize to all of you, there's so many good questions here. Um, I know we're gonna capture them all uh, in our records and for a few folks, you ask some specific questions, um, we'll, we'll try to get back to you so that they're answered. Thanks so much for all the participation. Um, let's see what happens next here. I know I have a few concluding comments. I think this is where I say goodbye to Tony and Taj. Yeah, thank you everybody for tuning in. Thanks, Thank John. Both. Thank you both. We're just gonna gonna look. It's Tony. There it goes, Tony. Okay. Um, we're just gonna wrap up again. I want to thank all of you for participating tonight, for being supporters of the Land Trust. Um, the the slide you see here. I'm gonna just hit on a few things. If if you want to keep engaged with our work, there's so many ways to find out about what we're doing, from our website to all of our different social media accounts, and of course you can sign up for our newsletter. Um, if there are, if there's information about wildlife corridors that you're interested in, we have a lot of materials that we've produced over the years, guides for private landowners, more background on our scientific research, and some of the, um, the stewardship efforts that are underway. So there's a lot more information that we can get to you about wildlife corridors and wildlife conservation. And uh, please keep an eye out for our webinar series. This is how we're doing our best to, to keep you connected to our work and to nature. Uh, our next webinar is on May 20th, and it's with Heidi Herman, and she's doing a talk on seaweed, ecology, use, and harvest. So we are, we are going to the marine environment, and we're gonna learn all about seaweed from an expert, um, an expert in marine biology. And can't leave without saying not only thank you, but we rely on your support. Um, thank you so much during this difficult time for, for being part of the Land Trust family. Uh, any any support that you can provide to us through your normal donations, through membership is so greatly appreciated. We look forward to getting back out on the land with you all soon. And for any of you who, who have questions or anything about tonight, just please reach out to me or, or Tony or Taj. We're happy to, to stay in touch and, and talk more. So thank you all so much. I'm going to say good night. And it's going to be kind of abrupt, but bye-bye. Have a good evening. <laughs>